if you're new here, if you're here for the first time, we want you to know that we're a church that believes Jesus is for you. And what's that mean? That means that wherever you are in your life, Jesus loves you and, and he cares about you and your life matters to him. And I believe he wants to say something to you and that whatever your experience in life has been or is today, he wants to step into that and he wants to make it better in some way. And I hope you find out a little bit more about what that's gonna look like, maybe even this morning. Uh, we've been in a couple of series through the book of Galatians for like 10 weeks now. And I've enjoyed these series really because uh, it's not only like, always good to just get into a book and go through it piece by piece. But what Paul talks about all through this letter to the church in Galatia is stuff that we are still trying to wrap our minds around 2,000 years later. It's this idea that before Jesus, we were to be right with God, we were under the law. And what that meant was we had to do all the right things and not do the wrong things. And if, if we could check enough of those boxes and leave the right ones unchecked, then maybe we could be good with God. But it was a standard no one could live up to. It was impossible until Jesus came into the picture and he introduced grace. And now because of grace and because of Jesus, it's not about how good you are or how good I am. It's about the fact that we are good enough because Jesus was good enough. And his grace covers our shortcomings and our imperfections. And Paul writes this letter to the Galatians to try to communicate that point that it's not about being good enough anymore. No, what's in the law isn't necessarily a bad thing, not all of it, but there's 613 rules and most of us have a problem with just a few rules. So 613, just imagine living with this constant feeling of discouragement, this feeling of it's just impossible to be right with God. And what Paul is saying is it's not about that anymore, it's about grace. And it's about Jesus. And what Paul is explaining all through this letter, this book of Galatians that we've been going through for 10 weeks now, and we continue this morning, is this idea that we're good enough because Jesus was good enough, but that our response to that needs to be, we're not living for the law anymore. Now we're living by the Spirit. The presence of God that's with us, that's dwelling with us, that's working through us. We live by the Spirit. And Paul says, as we do, some things in our life should change. And he calls these a fruit of the Spirit. That's what we've been working our way through the past few weeks. And the idea is that as we live by the Spirit, as we walk with Jesus, we should start to look more like him. And this is, this is not a concept that we're unfamiliar with. In fact, there's a lot of research that shows that the people that you spend most of your time with, in fact, specifically the five people that you spend the most time with, you will eventually start to look like them. And so just like that, as we walk with Jesus, as we spend time with him, we should start to look like him. And around here, we call that being an all-in disciple. And we say that being an all-in disciple means that not only should we know and follow Jesus, but we should be being changed by Jesus. As he's working around us and in us and through us, we should look less like we did before and more like him. And as we do, we commit to his mission, which is to share his hope with other people who need the same good news and the same grace. And so we should be being changed. And, and here's the simple truth, okay? And I'm gonna step on some toes here. And if this offends you, maybe this is what he wants you to hear today. If you're somebody who claims to follow Jesus, but your life is not changing to look more like Jesus, then you might be a fan, but you're not a follower. You might be a fan, but you're not a disciple. Because what Paul is teaching us in this passage is if you are truly walking with Jesus, then you should look less like you and more like him. In these specific areas, these fruit of the spirit, these characteristics of Jesus that are supposed to start to pop up in our lives, like the ones we've already talked about. For example, we talked about love and we said, loved people love people. When you begin to understand how much God loves you, then your only logical response is to love other people the same way. And as you do, they get to see who God is and what he's like and how much he loves them because they see it through your life. So love people, love people. We talked about joy and Brian shared this idea that joy is not an emotion that's based on your circumstances. It's a position of your heart and your soul in response to realizing whatever my circumstances are, good or bad, Jesus loves me and has grace for me. And if I can wrap my head around that, I can have joy even when I'm unhappy. And so joy isn't an emotion, it's a position. A couple weeks ago, we talked about peace. You got to hear Monica Peters share her story. And guys, I'm telling you, I could not imagine how somebody could do a better job sharing a testimony of the kind of peace that surpasses understanding that Jesus gives us when we need it the most. And we said this, that peace comes from not only knowing Jesus as your savior, but of trusting him as your Lord. 
And when you allow him to be in control of your life, then you can be sure that everything that happens, good or bad, it's all under his control. It's all under his oversight. He is, he's got you. And then even when things hit the fan, there's a peace that can be present in your life because your faith and your trust are in him and that he is in control. And then last week, Brian talked about patience. He shared this point, and this was profound, okay? He said, the patience that God wants to grow in you is the same patience God has for you. And that one hit me like a punch in the gut as I was sitting in Terminal B of the O'Hare Airport with Ashley and United delayed our flight for the third time. And I decided that was the time I should listen to Brian's sermon and I wanted to shut it off about halfway through because I was not feeling like being a very patient person and she's nodding her head right now because I, I was anything but patient, right? And then I listened to that sermon and it was like God said, mm, which, you know, he doesn't do that, but it felt like that. So anyway, maybe you know what I mean. So anyways, today we're gonna continue this series and what we're gonna talk about today is equally difficult. I'm just gonna give you a heads up, but here's the deal. If you are here and you're somebody who says, I would follow Jesus, I would, I would say, yeah, that's me. I've committed my life to him, I follow him, then I want you to lean in because what we're gonna talk about today is absolutely vital if we're gonna be people who not only follow Jesus but reflect who he is to others. And if you're somebody who would say, I don't know that I'm there yet, I'm here because there's like a girl I wanna date and she won't go out with me unless I go to church with her. So you're here this morning, welcome, I'm glad you're here. If that's you, if you don't know where you are with Jesus yet, if you would say, I haven't given him my life yet, I'm not even sure that's something I wanna do, I still want you to lean in because here's the cool thing. Kindness is something that people around you need whether it comes from Jesus in your life or not. And so there's something good to be found in this for you. So don't, don't lean out, you know, this is, this is for everybody, but this is a hard one, so I just wanna pray with you before we go any further, so let's just pray together. God, this, is, um, this, this one's tough. <laughs> it's not our instinct as humans, to be kind when other people are not. And so this morning, I just wanna ask for two things. God, first of all, would you help us to be open-minded and receptive to what you wanna say to us this morning? And more than that, would you work in us and and be working in our hearts and our minds to change us to look more like you? And in this case, that means to be kind even when we don't want to, even when it doesn't make sense, even when everybody says that we shouldn't be. God, would you just help us uh, to, to look more like you and less like us, to look more like Jesus and how he was kind. Uh, God, we just pray for that today and we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen, amen. If you have a Bible with you, open up to Luke chapter 10. We're gonna put this on the screen too, so if you don't, no worries. But Luke chapter 10, and while you're turning there, I wanna tell you a story about a guy that I heard uh, recently, he was also traveling, he was flying somewhere, and, and as he gets to the airport, he walks up to the little uh, check-in kiosk, right, and he's, he takes his bag and throws it up on the scale, and the scale reads that his bag is a couple pounds overweight, and so he's insisting that it's not, but the girl says, ah, it's right there, I, I gotta charge you extra, and he's mad about that, I fly all the time, you can't charge me extra for one pound over the limit, and she says, I really don't have a choice, and so he gets mad, and then the thing wouldn't print his boarding pass, the computer's giving her an error, and so he's waiting and he's impatient and he wants to get through the line and get on through security, but the, the computer's giving her problems and, and then he just, it's like one thing after another, another piles up and he's getting more and more frustrated and as his frustration grows, he's beginning to take it out on this poor girl behind the ticket counter and, uh, and he's just, he goes from being frustrated with the situation to insulting her and he starts to berate her. I mean, he's insulting not only the job she's doing but her intelligence. Like, I can't believe they'd pay an idiot like you that can't even work a computer and he's just chewing her out, letting her have it and a crowd begins to form around and they're watching as this guy is just letting this girl have it, right? He's, he is just a jerk. He is just laying into her for things that really aren't even her fault. And the whole time, the crowd is blown away because she just stands behind the counter with a smile on her face, never says a word, never snaps back, and just takes it. So finally, after like five minutes of this guy chewing this girl out, he walks away, and another customer comes up to the girl and says, I gotta ask, I don't understand, how, how were you able to stand there with a smile on your face and not say a word to that jerk? You just took it, how do you do that? I would have let him have it, what, what, what's your secret? And she said, well, you see, it's pretty simple. I know something he doesn't know. See, that guy, he, he's gonna go to Seattle today, but his bags are gonna go to Miami. I love stories like that, don't you? Like when people get what they deserve, isn't that the best? 
Man, like, okay, so when I'm driving down the road and somebody cuts me off, I get mad, I instantly start to pray, but I'm not praying, God, give me patience, God, help me be full of grace. I'm praying, God, please let there be a police officer who saw what just happened and pull that guy over. One time it happened, I was driving down Everhard and this car cut me off, weaved through traffic and there was a Jackson Township cop that saw the whole thing and flew out and pulled the guy over and I was like, yes! I'm so happy. I got some stuff to work on. Okay, I'm not perfect. We love it when people get what they deserve. We love it. Justification, right? Until we get what we deserve. And we love grace. We love to receive it. We love to talk about it. We love grace until we have to give it. And we love it when it comes our direction, but not when it's supposed to come from our direction to somebody else. Man, that's what we're gonna talk about today. So that's why this is such a tough one. So let me start here. The heart of Christianity comes back to this verse. John chapter one, verse 14. that simply says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. It's this idea that the word, the promises of God, the prophecies, everything that he ever promised or said he would do, eventually he put flesh on it. He put skin and bones on it. It came in the form of Jesus. Jesus came into the world and he made his dwelling among us. In other words, he was one of us. He lived with us. He walked with us. He was just, he was one of us, fully God and fully man. And there's so much significance in that. And one of the places in scripture that I love a picture that we get to see of this contrast is in John chapter 17. Is This is like just before Jesus is gonna be arrested and put on trial. And we see this picture of Jesus praying and I love it because it's a picture of God praying to God. And if I can listen in on a prayer, that's one I wanna listen in on, right? And so we see this prayer Jesus is praying and John records this in his gospel. This is John the apostle who, who believed in Jesus and then unbelieved in Jesus and then got exiled and kind of believed in Jesus again and then did believe in Jesus again. And as he's processed all this stuff, this is the conclusion that he came to, that the word became flesh and dwelled among us. And in John chapter 17, he's recording this prayer, right? Jesus is praying, he's saying, God, you sent me into the world to glorify you. You sent me into the world to do a job to glorify you. And then he says something weird, okay? And I'll tell you why this is weird. Because he says, now that the work is accomplished, Wait a second. He hasn't gone to the cross yet. Now, most of us, if somebody asks you, why did Jesus come into the world? You don't even have to know all that much about him. If you've heard much about Jesus, and your answer to that question would be, well, he came into the world to die on a cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins and, and to be raised to new life so that we could have life. Like if you've been a Christian for long or following Jesus or even around church, that's your answer. So how is it possible that before any of that happens, he's praying and he says, now that the work is accomplished, now that I've glorified you, what could he mean by that? Let me tell you what I think. I think it's this. I think what Jesus is referring to is the fact that God sent him into the world to put on flesh, to dwell among us, to explain God to us. He came to take the guesswork out of God. You see, Jesus didn't just claim to have the best explanation of who God is. He came to be the best explanation of who God is. He came to not only teach us what love and kindness and peace and patience and all these other things look like, he came to show us. And so as he prays this, what he's saying is, God, you sent me into the world to show people what you look like. And gosh, they haven't seen anything yet, but we've already accomplished this work. And I, and I hope you get the glory for it and now glorify me so that you can get even more glory. Like this is the prayer that he prays, right? And, and so already up to this point, before he even went to the cross, he had taught us and showed us what and who and how God loves us and what it looks like to love other people, and, and he instructed us to do the same thing. And as he not only showed us but taught us, it consistently blew the minds of the people who listened in. As he told stories like these, he told three parables, the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son, stories that reinforce this point that God is not out to get you and catch you and punish you. But if you're somebody who is far from God today, and you don't need me to tell you that because if you are, you know. That God is not out to get back at you. He wants to get back to you. He does not wanna get you back. He wants to win you back and bring you back. And that blew the minds 
of the audience in Jesus' day that they had this picture of God that it's a law system, it's justification, it's I'm not good enough, so there's punishment, and I have to go through these sacrifices and these rituals and these ceremonies, and, and I have to get back to God, and now he's trying to get back to me? And it blew their minds. Blew their minds when Jesus preached sermons like the Sermon on the Mount where he said things like, it's not enough to just not hate your enemies. Do you actually have to go so far as to love them? Oh, that's hard. But he said, it's not enough just to not hate them. You gotta, you gotta go out of your way to love your enemies. And then he told stories like the one we're gonna look at here in Luke chapter 10. That's a story that 2,000 years later, we still haven't gotten over. I mean, it's a story where Jesus completely redefined what it means to be somebody's neighbor. And he said, it's not about people who are like you or near you. It's about anyone who has a need. They become your neighbor. And in this story, he makes a Samaritan a hero over a priest. Well, why is that a big deal? It's because he's preaching to Jewish people here. He's teaching Jewish people. And, and if you don't know the context, Jewish people and Samaritan people were enemies, had been for generations and generations and generations, and it wasn't just we don't like you, it was deeply held fundamental existential differences in how they viewed God and what it meant to worship him. And it had gone on for years, and so listen, what we have here on our hands is not just a disagreement, it's a race war. And there's this tension in their culture, and I love this story because listen, I don't know if you read the news, we got a little bit of that going on in our world today, don't we? We can relate to the tension. And I don't care about your politics, but our world is full of tension. It's not even a political thing, it's a human thing. There's tension in our world, it's just the way it goes. We're coming into another election cycle. Buckle up. So he tells a story and, and he gives us a brand new definition, a brand new picture of what it means to be a neighbor. Check this out, this is Luke chapter 10. Again, we're gonna put this on the screen. So as it often happens, a religious leader comes to Jesus to ask him some questions. It says this, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? And the man answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you've heard that before, right? We call that the greatest yeah, there you go, one person. Good. I'm glad you read your Bible. Greatest commandment, greatest commandment. It refers back to Deuteronomy, right? When somebody asked Jesus, what's the most important commandment? That's what he responded with. Clearly, this man had heard him teach and he knew the right answer and Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But it says the man wanted to justify himself, so he pressed a little harder. Now, let me paint the full context for you. Let me tell you what's really going on here. This man didn't like some people and he needed an excuse or a reason to say it was okay. He wanted to justify his hatred or his dislike for some other people. And so he continues to press on this with Jesus. It says he, he wanted to justify himself. So he asked this question, and who is my neighbor? In other words, Jesus, surely there's some definition for who I'm supposed to love and who I'm not supposed to love, or who I'm supposed to like and who I'm not supposed to like. Can you paint a better picture for me because you can't possibly mean everybody because the world is full of really hard people to love, much less like. And so Jesus, I love this, he doesn't respond with an answer, he responds with a story. Check this out. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. This man's bleeding on the side of the street, dying. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. Now let me stop right here and let me emphasize. These two religious leaders are going from Jerusalem to Jericho. Why is that significant? It's significant because their jobs were to be religious leaders in Jerusalem. That tells us they're going away from work so they are not going anywhere important. They had the time, they had the ability, they had the openness in their schedules to stop and care for this man, but instead they looked at him and they said, that looks messy, and they walked over here and they crossed by where they didn't have to get too close. They ran from the mess. And then Jesus continues, but a Samaritan, this is where all the Jewish people, their ears perk up a little bit. A Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. 
And he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out some money, two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after them, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any expense you may have. And then Jesus posed this question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And this, this leader couldn't answer any other way. He said, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. And so there's your answer to the question, who is my neighbor, in case you're wondering. It's not just people who are like you or near you. It's anyone who has a need. And what Jesus is trying to reinforce here is this principle that kindness is love revealed in words and actions. It's one thing to say you love people, it's another thing to be kind, but when you do, it reveals your love in your words and actions. This guy who had nothing left, he's laying in the gutter, you know, he needs help, right? He was a mess. And these two people who, they, this is my people, I'm Jewish, he's Jewish, this is my people, right? I should help him. They cross the street and walk the other way. But the man who makes no sense in any way, culturally, ethnically, religiously, racially, none of that. Like, it makes no sense that this man would stop and help. Like, if you were a Samaritan, you didn't travel through a Jewish town. If you were Jewish, you didn't travel through a Samaritan village because your life might be in danger. So it makes no sense for me to stop and help this guy because if I were the one laying on the side of the road, he would probably walk across the other side, if not stop to spit on me and kick me. But yet this Samaritan man stops and he helps this guy at great expense, and it took a lot of time, and it took him out of his way, and he even followed up and came back later. He showed kindness to this guy. He saw somebody and he said, that looks messy, and then he ran toward the mess. He ran toward the mess. Now, which one was a neighbor who showed kindness? It's the person who ran toward the mess. And what we learn is this. We learn this in this story, that running toward a mess will cost you something, and it'll confuse people. It won't make any sense. And it'll require humility. I guarantee you it required humility of this Samaritan man to, to humble himself to help an enemy. It'll require humility. And running toward the mess, if we're honest, is the last thing many of us wanna do. We don't, we don't wanna get messy ourselves. And listen, you know who the messy people are in your life. I don't need to tell you, you know who they are. But here's the thing. You know what a mess looks like because you are one. And I know what a mess looks like because I am one. We see it when we look in the mirror. And the thing is, Jesus looked at us just like this Samaritan looked at the man on the side of the road and he said, that looks messy. And then Jesus ran toward the mess. He ran toward me. He ran toward you. And he wasn't afraid to get his hands messy and his feet messy. He ran to the mess. And he got in the middle of it. He got involved just like the man in this story. And so yes, Radical kindness, running toward the mess, it's gonna cost you something and it's gonna confuse people and, 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 and yeah, it's weird and, and it's gonna take your time and sometimes even your money and it's gonna be frustrating and it's gonna require you to humble yourself. But man, it is an investment. It doesn't just cost you. There is a return on the investment when you show kindness to somebody, when you invest in their life. And it pays a dividend like this, okay? Okay. It will impact individuals. You can't tell me that that man wasn't impacted by the kindness that this Samaritan person showed him. And just like that, when you show kindness to somebody, radical kindness, it makes no sense. It will impact their life. Sometimes just one act or one word of kindness is all it takes to brighten a gloomy day for somebody, to heal a wounded heart, to literally change the trajectory of a life. It has an impact on individuals. And when we're kind, we reflect the kindness and the love of Christ to other people who need it most. Another return on the investment is it will influence relationships. Kindness is like a relational currency. It builds bridges to forgiveness and communication. It makes people feel valued and appreciated and respected. It opens doors for you to share your faith. It influences relationships. And when you're kind to people, it will inspire others to follow suit, and you will create a chain reaction of kindness that will go on. It's like ripples on the water when you drop a pebble in. It may seem small, but the ripples just go on and on and on. It will begin a chain reaction of kindness that will continue on beyond that act, even beyond your life, maybe because you showed one act of kindness or mercy to somebody who needed it, and they decided to pass that on to somebody else. Kindness can change the cycle of hurt 
in the lives of the people around you. How do I know this, by the way? I know this because as I see Jesus show kindness to people all throughout the scripture, this is exactly the result that I see on his investment. This is the return. And I love it that Jesus didn't just teach this stuff, but he showed us what it looks like to live it out. He showed us, he modeled it, he, he modeled running toward the messes, he healed messy people, he ate with messy people, he visited them in their homes, and almost always it happened this way, it happened the way that Bradley and, and David said a few minutes ago, just as he went along, as he lived his life. And so we learn this from the story, that kindness is using an ordinary occasion to show extraordinary grace. It doesn't require this big, massive, earth-shattering opportunity to come along, and it's just this miraculous thing. It's just, it's just being aware and available, and as opportunities present themselves in your life, it's choosing to show kindness where maybe otherwise you wouldn't have. It's using an ordinary occasion to show extraordinary grace. The example I always think of is this woman who's caught in adultery, right? She's in the act. I don't need to tell you what that means. And these religious leaders, they've been, they, they know her reputation, so they've just been waiting. And they catch her and they drag her out of the bedroom, they drag her out of the house, they drag her into the street, she's naked, they drag her to Jesus in the temple and they throw her down in the dirt in front of the temple steps and they say, all right, Jesus, here she is, we caught her in bed with that guy, she's not married to him, it's, the law says we should kill her. But what do you say? And, and he's trapped here because if he says, yes, kill her, then he's not really the man of love and grace that he claims to be. But if he spares her life, then he's broken the law and they can put him on trial for that. And so they think we finally got him. So Jesus, what do we do? And these guys, they're already holding the rocks that they're gonna use to throw at this woman to end her life. And so what does Jesus do? Draws something in the dirt. I don't know what it was. It doesn't matter. I don't even know if he looked up, but he said these words, let he who is without sin throw the first stone. And what did they do? They looked at each other and went, dang it. And one by one, they drop their rocks in the dirt and they walk away. And this woman who I can only imagine, guys, again, she's, she's laying naked in the street and she's covered in dirt and she's crying and the dirt tonight, it's just caked on her face from the tears because she thinks her life is about to end and beyond that, she's probably praying that it will because she's humiliated and she's lonely and she's embarrassed and she's frankly exhausted at this point and probably the rocks for her would have been relief. Let me stop here and say somebody in the room, somebody watching online, that might be where you are today. It's possible that the pain in your life is so intense right now that it would actually be relief. In fact, you've thought about it. Maybe you thought about it when you went to bed last night or this morning when you woke up and that's why you're here or watching is this is your last shot. Because maybe like this woman, you've reached a point in your life where you've just thrown your hands up and you said, this is not worth it anymore. It hurts too bad. I'm just done. And so she's laying in the dirt in front of Jesus, completely humiliated, praying for the rocks. And Jesus runs toward the mess. And he gets involved and he spares her life. And then the best part of the whole thing is he speaks words of life into her. As these, these men drop the rocks and they walk away, Jesus says, woman, where are the people who accuse you? And she says, I guess they're gone. And Jesus says, then I don't accuse you either. And I sure don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. And he used that opportunity to speak words of life into her. And I want you to know today that Jesus wants to intervene in your situation and he wants to speak words of life to you today. Maybe that's why you're here. Because Jesus wants to speak life into you today. But I need you to know that just like the words that have been spoken to you shape who you are, the words you speak have the ability and the power to shape other people. They carry weight. And we have to be so careful the words that we use when we speak to other people because they will shape people for the better or for the worse. We see Jesus speak words of life into this woman and he offers her radical kindness. He runs toward the mess when it makes no sense heard Andy Stanley say it this way, kindness is loaning someone your strength instead of reminding them of their weakness. I love that. So can I just tell you, 
I have a vision for our church that from this day forward more than ever before, we would be a church, and by the way, church is not a building, it's not a service, it's not a program, it's not a campus, it's not a place. Church is you and me, it's the people who claim God as their God and Jesus as their Savior and the Spirit as their guide. It's us together saying, Jesus, we're gonna go where you wanna take us, we're gonna love people the way you want us to love people, we're gonna show kindness when it makes no sense, even when we don't want to, because you showed it to us, that's church, okay? We're making a difference in Jesus' name. And so I have a vision that now more than ever, and from this day moving forward more than ever before, we would be a church that runs toward messes. That when we see the person on the side of the road, physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, mentally, that we don't say, oh, that looks messy, but we're gonna do our thing over here. But we would run toward that mess and we would get our hands dirty and we would get our feet dirty and we would pick them up and we would love and we would care for and we would show kindness to in Jesus' name so that a life is changed and an eternity takes a different trajectory. That's what I want this church to be and do. I want us to be a church that runs toward messes. When it's what we don't wanna do, when it's the last thing that makes sense, we say, no, Jesus, you ran toward our mess. We're gonna run toward the mess. We're gonna have to be intentional. You're gonna have to be intentional. Look for opportunities to show kindness. You're gonna have to extend grace just like Jesus extended grace to you, even when you don't want to. You're gonna have to listen with compassion. Given, listen, the, the biggest act of kindness that you can often give to somebody is to listen to someone who needs to be heard. And listen with compassion, not seeking to respond. When's the last time you sat down with somebody that you had a disagreement with and you just listened and you didn't seek to respond? Listen with compassion, forgive freely. You're supposed to be a conduit of grace and forgiveness to people, but when you hold a grudge and don't forgive, it's like you shut off that faucet and you just keep it all to yourself. And God is saying there are people who need to see and feel kindness and love and grace and they can't because you're holding this grudge. So we're gonna have to be people who forgive freely. It's not easy. And we're gonna have to be people who are proactive. We don't wait for opportunities to come along. We go find them. We go look for some messes and we get involved and we speak words of life in Jesus' name. So here's my challenge. This week, pick a person and do something kind for them. In fact, right now, open up a note in your phone, set a reminder, put it on your calendar, write it on the back of your weekly or envelope or a piece of paper. Pick a person, pick an act of kindness. Buy coffee for the person in line behind you. Pick up the tab for a stranger at a restaurant. They won't even know it was you. They never met you before. Just show kindness with no strings attached and trust that that seed is gonna be one that God waters. You know, leave like a big tip. You, maybe you already do or feel like you leave huge tips anymore for everybody, right? But leave a bigger one. And don't, don't leave, don't put a string on it. It doesn't have to come with like a tract or an invite to church or something. Just leave a big tip, okay? Do, do something kind. Send an encouraging note to somebody, Bake a meal or, or something for a neighbor or a friend. Do something kind. Pick the person, pick the act, choose it, do it now. Don't wait or you won't do it. And then for some of you, here's the level two challenge because you're ready for this or maybe you just need it. I had somebody come up to me after church and say, man, I really wish you hadn't said that. So here it is. Do it for someone you don't like. Mm. Do it for someone who hurt you. And you're like, Jimmy, you don't understand because what they did, they didn't just say something mean. They ruined my life. It's been years of therapy. I'm still not over it. I can't sleep at night. The hurt in my life because of what this person did, I don't know that it's ever gonna go away. Listen, I'm gonna tell you something. When I said that a minute ago, do it for the person who hurt you, if they're the person that came to mind, I did not put that thought in your mind. But I have an idea who might have. So do that, do, do it for them. Luke 6 says, but love your enemies and do good to them and lend to them without expecting anything back. And then your reward will be great and you will be children of the most high because he's kind to the ungrateful and wicked. But what if they're not grateful? What if they don't appreciate it? What if they don't reciprocate it? Listen, 
Romans says that while we were still Jesus' enemies, he died for us. So what else could we do but be kind to somebody? Now, I know this is not easy. And I know that what I'm asking you to do might be the hardest thing that anybody's ever asked you to do. But you have a choice. When somebody does something that hurts you, you can react in a like manner. You can do something that hurts them. You can do the vengeful thing, right? You can be the guy at the airport check-in kiosk. And you can perpetuate a cycle of hurt. Or you can react in kindness. You can react to the grace of Jesus and not the actions of another person. And when you do, you will break the cycle of hurt and you'll begin a new cycle of kindness and grace. And and, and here's why. Because reactions speak louder than words. So whatever you claim to be about, man, it's gonna be proven in your actions as you use ordinary occasions to show extraordinary grace. So do it for somebody you don't wanna do it for. And when you do, that is what it means to run toward the mess. Kindness is what it looks like when love runs toward a mess just like Jesus ran to you and ran to me. And here's the cool thing. Again, you know a mess when you see one because you are one, and I know a mess when I see one because I am one. And if you will run toward a mess, and I will run toward a mess, you know what happens is we will run toward each other. And when we do, the unity that Jesus prayed for, the unity that the world needs so bad because the world's full of division and it's full of tension, it's full of hatred and dislike and intolerance, it's full of just this, this pain because of all that stuff. Man, if you will run toward a mess and I will run toward a mess, then we will run toward each other. And what we will be reminded of is this, that the mess that brings us together is the mess that brought God near. And as we run toward the mess and when we come together, we're reminded of that, then we will be stronger together and more able to reflect that onto the people in the world who need to not just hear about it, they need to see it. And that's what Jesus did. So we're gonna take communion together, which is a time in our service where we reflect on the ultimate act of kindness and exactly what we're talking about when Jesus saw our mess and instead of saying, no, I don't wanna get dirty, he ran to it. He ran to you. If you are the person today who is at the point in your life where you have never felt more broken, Jesus ran toward your mess and he is not out to get back at you. He wants to get back to you. He doesn't want to pay you back. He wants to win you back. And he proved it when he went to the cross. And he died so that you could be forgiven for whatever it is that you need to be forgiven of. And they laid him in a tomb and he didn't stay there. We believe that three days later he rose from the dead and he is alive today so that we can have life. And this time in our service, where again, I hope you got the elements when you came in, or if you're online, I hope you have some crackers and some juice so you can participate. This is where we every single week stop and we reflect on that and we thank Jesus for his kindness, radical kindness when he ran toward the mess and it didn't make any sense, but he said, I love you so much, I'm gonna do it anyway. And here's what I wanna ask you to do. We're gonna take communion, I'll give you a minute to do that. We're gonna sing one more song, don't leave. I know you got lunch plans. I know you got places to go. You wanna get your kids and beat the crowd out. There's no football game to get to. The Browns already won. We're undefeated, baby. It's gonna be a good Sunday. So take five more minutes. And as we sing this last song, pray for an opportunity this week to show radical kindness and for the strength when that opportunity comes along. And the prayer just goes like this. Jesus, you showed radical kindness to me when you ran toward my mess. Give me the strength to run toward a mess this week. And church, let's go bless some people by showing some kindness that makes no sense. And when people lean in and they say, what's that about? You can say, Jesus changed my life. And this is what it looks like. God, thank you so much for the picture we have in your word of what it means to live this out. God, I pray Right now, we say thank you for the cross and the empty tomb and the kindness and the grace that you showed us. And now, God, would you give us the strength because of that to show it to others. Jesus, use us to be your picture of kindness in the world around us so that people will be drawn to you and your kingdom will grow and eternity, heaven will be a little more crowded 
because you work through us to change lives with radical grace and kindness. Thank you for showing that to us. We pray this in your name, amen.